Good morning. Uh, I'm Jeff Davis. I'm the executive director of the MSU Alumni Association. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, everyone uh, to Bulldog Bites, our virtual speaker series, uh, which features MSU faculty, staff, researchers, and alumni who are eager to share their work, expertise, and impact on a wide range of unique and interesting topics. Uh, we look forward to showcasing some of the extraordinary people and programs within our MSU community and hope that you enjoy this exciting and interactive virtual speaker series. Today's installment of Bulldog Bites, um, past plagues to the present day pandemic, how understanding epidemic infectious disease in the past helps us understand it in the present. We're so very pleased uh, to have our featured speaker, Dr. Molly Zuckerman, who's an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology and Middle Eastern Cultures here at MSU. Uh, we're also fortunate to have our moderator joining Dr. Zuckerman this morning, uh, Dr. Anna Osterholtz, Assistant Professor in the Department of Anthropology and Middle Eastern Cultures. Uh, we encourage our viewing audience to utilize the Q&A feature via WebEx and the comments section via our Facebook live stream to submit your questions. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to turn over our program this morning to Dr. Osterholtz and Dr. Zuckerman. Welcome. Thank you. Um, hello and welcome. Uh, I'm Anna Osterholtz. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology and Middle Eastern Cultures and I've been here for about four years. Um, I'm a bioarchaeologist specializing in how trauma and mortuary practices create identity in the past. I work primarily in Croatia and I run two different study abroad programs for students who want to study bioarchaeology and mortuary archaeology. Uh, it's a great honor for us to be part of the Bulldog Bites program and we want to thank the Alumni Association for the invitation today. Um, today, I'm happy to introduce my colleague, Dr. Molly Zuckerman. Molly is an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology and Middle Eastern Cultures here at MSU. She grew up in and around Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She earned BA degrees in Anthropology and Women's Studies from Penn State. She then completed a year of post-baccalaureate study at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History before moving to the South. She earned an MA and PhD in Anthropology from Emory University, as well as a graduate certificate in Gender Studies. She next had a postdoctoral fellowship for a year at the University of South Carolina before starting at MSU. Molly is a bioarchaeologist focused on learning about human health and disease in the past using information recovered from human skeletal material. This evidence of human skeletal material is enriched by contextual information from the archaeological sites that the remains are recovered from. It's also enriched by historical information about the original human cultures represented by the remains and the archaeological site. And when it is available, she also incorporates information from studies of the DNA of bacteria recovered from the remains. Using this evidence, her work focuses on understanding how a person's social identity, such as their ethnicity, gender, and socioeconomic status, affects their health. She also researches how we can use biological material recovered from calcified dental plaque, known as calculus, to determine what infectious diseases people were infected with in the past, especially those that wouldn't otherwise leave distinctive marks on their skeleton. She's also interested in understanding how the bacteria which causes syphilis has changed over time and answering one of the great mysteries surrounding syphilis, besides whether Columbus was responsible for it. This other mystery is how the characteristics of humans infected with syphilis impact their disease process, whether their age, other infectious diseases that they have, and whether they've experienced a lot of stress during their lives led to them having a relatively harmless version of the disease or led to them having a disabling, devastating disease process. Also, why do some pass this disease to their partner and children and others don't? Molly has just been awarded a large grant from the National Science Foundation to fund work done by herself and undergraduate students at MSU to examine these factors. Lastly, she works with other Mississippi researchers, including myself, to better understand the lives and health experiences of those ex institutionalized at the Mississippi State Asylum, which opened in Jackson, Mississippi in the late 1800s. In addition to her most recent grant, she's also been the recipient of three other grants from the NSF. She's also edited two volumes and published a multitude of articles. So today we're going to ask her questions about how scientific knowledge about past epidemics and infectious disease can be used to better understand present day epidemics and pandemics helping people to improve their health, lessen the effects of disease, and avoid future epidemics. Molly? Molly, you're muted. 
Thank you. <laughs> Didn't want background noise to come in. Anna, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I really appreciate it. It's such an honor to be part of the Bulldog Brights program, and I'm so honored by the invitation from the MSU Alumni Association. Thank you so much for having us here today. I'm really excited to answer questions that all of you have about the um, issues uh, that we'll talk about today, and I welcome all of the questions from those joining us today. I know that many of us are fascinated by archaeology and what we can learn about the past. For me, and I hope for all of you, that information becomes even richer and more fascinating when we incorporate evidence about bodies, lives, and lived experiences in the past. Regardless of your experiences or your level of background knowledge, please ask questions through Facebook and the WebEx platform. I will be so happy to answer as many of them as I can. And I will repeat what I emphasize in the classroom. There are no dumb questions. So why skeletons? What do you learn about health and disease from skeletons as opposed to anything else? Sure, that's a great question. So we know that we can recover information about human health and disease from historical documents, written documents from the past, as well as archaeological evidence, so information from archaeological sites. But all of this is indirect. People recorded it or left traces about it. And when we want to understand how human biology worked in the past and how human health and disease worked in the past, direct evidence right from the body is very, very immediately useful. Skeletons act like archives of our lived experiences throughout our lives. Every time that we grow and develop, our skeletons change. Our skeletons are maintained throughout adulthood. And then when we, they contain all of the, uh, they contain records of all of our past experiences. And like I like to explain to my students, skeletons can open themselves up like books containing knowledge about human lives in the past, as long as you know how to read them. And that's one of the things that we teach our students here at Mississippi State about how to obtain direct information about human biology, health, and disease from skeletal material. For instance, as you're growing up, you record information about your health, your diet, whether you're uh, affected by diseases, etc., in your teeth, which after they form, don't change. They stay as these little libraries, archives of information about your childhood. In addition, um, human skeletons from the skull on down can show information about our activities during our lives, our lifestyle, our nutrition, diet, our level of health, um, whether we experienced a lot of stress during our lives, as well as the health and disease conditions that we experienced. Many of these leave distinctive marks on our skeletons. For instance, tuberculosis and syphilis um, can leave distinctive marks on our skeletons. And other experiences can leave patterns of marks on our skeletons, like osteoarthritis, for instance, which so many of us are affected by, will leave patterns um, throughout the various joints in the body that, they are, um, that this condition affects. In addition, when it's available, I like to incorporate knowledge from biomolecules, so biological molecules that can be recovered from human skeletal material. That includes small traces of the DNA of bacterial pathogens, these infectious disease causing microorganisms that can be captured in the calcified plaque on our teeth, which if you think about it is a really good reason to go to the dentist regularly, Ugh, right? Um, as well as uh, DNA from bacteria that can be caught up in the blood because when you're infected with something, pathogen is widespread throughout your blood and that can be captured in bones as well as proteins, uh, which pathogens can leave behind. And so I work with scientists at other institutions and here at Mississippi State to incorporate that uh, also direct evidence of what people suffered from in the past, their disease conditions, so that we can get a more complete understanding of what human lives were like in the past, how humans um, experienced the world, and how they adapted to their situations and environmental Ooh. conditions and um, their level of health and disease. Great. So why are you interested in learning about syphilis? Um, why are you interested in learning about the history of syphilis and why and how the course of disease varies from person to person? Another good question. So it seems in some ways kind of like an odd 
research interest, right? And I've received a lot of teasing throughout some components <laughs> of my graduate and professional career about this, right? Because it's a highly stigmatized condition. Like other sexually transmitted diseases, there are a lot of negative associations with it. But I like to approach it as um, though it's a disease like any other, right? And also, I'm very interested in it because as I'll talk about in a minute, syphilis is a major public health problem for communities in the United States as well as elsewhere. Now, I've been interested in learning about syphilis since I was an undergraduate, and I first learned that syphilis is one of the few known diseases whose symptoms varied in relation to sex, so whether you're male or female and affected by syphilis. Specifically, I was told by my teacher that it's more severe in males and less severe in females, and I wondered why? How strange. My new research project has its origins in this very question that I asked in my first teaching as an undergraduate student. One of the biggest mysteries about syphilis, like Anna mentioned, is whether it was present in Europe before Columbus's voyages of discovery or whether it was brought from the Americas to Europe by Columbus's voyages of discovery. But I am most interested in the other big mysterious question about it because this question answering that is the biggest for public health and for clinical medicine, and therefore communities all throughout the United States and uh, the world. And this question is, why does syphilis express very, very differently between different patients? A majority of cases of syphilis will resolve or get better without medical treatment, medical intervention, after the very earliest stage of infection. But in a substantial minority uh, minority of cases, around 15 to 40 percent of people who are infected with syphilis, the infection keeps going, it persists, and there is debilitating, devastating damage to um, the body. It damages the cardiovascular system, for instance, causing deadly aortic aneurysms. It causes painful and debilitating damage to the neurological system, resulting in paralysis, dementia, and other uh, manifestations. And it can cause destructive tumors and sometimes death in individuals, which is really terrible. Importantly, these cases also typically had really, really mild early symptoms to the point where people sometimes didn't even notice they, they were infected. They weren't correctly diagnosed um, with syphilis. They didn't even know to go to the doctor. And so they continued to have the disease and later go on to manifest terrible symptoms. Um, in addition to you know, the impacts on their own lives because they weren't treated, people with untreated syphilis can keep transmitting the infection to their partners or they can give it to their unborn children, causing what is known as congenital syphilis, which continues as one of our great tragedies within modern medicine and public health. Cases of congenital syphilis, which can cause miscarriage, stillbirth, early infant death, and lifelong neurological problems have spiked recently in the US rising almost fourfold just in the past seven years. This is mostly because cases of syphilis in pregnant women that were not, this is mostly because of cases of syphilis in pregnant women that were not treated. Despite hundreds of years of research on this subject, starting way back in the 1700s, scientists still don't know why some patients are able to recover their immune systems are able to recover from syphilis after an initial infection, while others have very mild early infection and then progress to those serious, even deadly symptoms in later stage infection, the ones that I just described. The number of reported cases of syphilis has increased two and a half fold in the past decade in Canada, the United States and Western Europe, and at even higher rates in other countries. A lot of this is because of inadequate testing tools. So in my project, which I'm very excited to be doing with several undergraduate students and graduate students at Mississippi State, we will study more than 300 skeletons from collections in the United States of 19th to early 20th century skeletons representing individuals who were diagnosed with syphilis prior to death and lived in the pre-antibiotic era. We will examine how chronic stress, so experiences of a lot of stress over the course of your lives, being constantly stressed, advanced age, 
health conditions, like being in, infected with more than one disease at a time or having one chronic disease at a time, like mm -hmm. having cardiovascular disease or diabetes or obesity. And their immune status relates to them either recovering from infection in the early stages or developing that terrible destructive late stage disease and thus having passed the um, condition to their partners and their children. The part of this project that most excites me is that this research can be translated into clinical tools that will make diagnosing syphilis in modern individuals more effective and accurate. Specifically, the project will result in better understanding of which patients are more likely to have mild early stage infection and therefore not be likely to get diagnosed and treated and instead progress to that severe late stage infection. This should lead to improved clinical guidelines for medical professionals for identifying, testing, and diagnosing these patients, ultimately helping to mitigate or stop the spread of syphilis. And I should note that there's another part of the project that I'm really excited about. So in the last year of the project, I'll be working with faculty in, the, um, in architecture and interior design here at Mississippi State, as well as undergraduate students in anthropology and undergraduate students in architecture and interior design. And courtesy of funding from the National Science Foundation as part of this larger project, we'll be erecting several museum exhibits for public um, outreach and education that will be in the Archaeology Museum of the Cobb Institute of Archaeology right here on campus that members of the public as well as K through 12 uh, school groups can come and tour and they'll provide information that's all about what we're talking about today. How we can use knowledge about health and disease in the past to enrich our understanding of the same processes and conditions in the present and help to better protect ourselves from infectious disease. In addition to those wonderful museum exhibits, which we'll be able to change out every few months, there will also be a dig pit for kids so that they can learn all about how we can recover information from the archaeological record and use it to better understand lives of people in the past, as well as the lives of people in the present. That sounds great. I'm how really excited. Yeah. How can knowledge of infectious diseases that affect the past populations help us to understand present day infectious diseases? Um, Thank and you. Novel diseases. That's a great question. So some of the most useful information when it comes to generating knowledge from past infectious diseases and applying to present day ones is about what's called host pathogen coevolution. And here, humans are the hosts, right? And the pathogens are those infectious disease causing microorganisms. Host pathogen coevolution is when the human host alongs with, evolves along with the pathogen. Now, pathogens evolve much faster than humans do because they can reproduce so incredibly quickly, whereas humans take about two and a half decades on average to reproduce. But we can think of it as an evolutionary arms race nonetheless, with the pathogens often having a kind of leg up on top of the humans. Studies of the entire DNA sequence or genome of pathogens that have been recovered from ancient skeleton material can tell us when they first started infecting humans. They can also tell us about how harmful these pathogens were when they first started infecting humans, sometimes as many as tens of thousands of years ago, and other times like with syphilis, just within the past few hundred years. Now, this is really important because pathogens that have just started to affect humans, having spilled over from another source, like a non-human animal, are typically much more harmful, or the technical term is virulent, than pathogens that have evolved alongside humans for a long period of time. Those that have been evolving alongside humans for a long time have come to a kind of detente, you know, a, a period of peace, right? They're coexisting where the humans can survive with the disease and the humans can survive or the and the disease can survive with the humans ones that are brand new to humans are typically much more harmful this is the case for instance with our current pandemic caused by SARS-CoV-2 for instance which is brand new to human populations having been resident just in non-human animals such as bats previously now, syphilis is famous for likely having been very, very harmful to humans soon after it emerged in the 1400s. Contemporary writers wrote that it caused sufferers' genitals to rot and fall off, caused amputation of noses and limbs, and terrible smelling pus-oozing sores, and regularly killed people. 
You might be thinking, huh, I don't remember learning about stuff like that in sex ed or health class. I feel like I would remember that. You're right, syphilis does not cause these symptoms anymore, right? It likely became less harmful within a few decades of its emergence. At least this is what historical records indicate. Now, understand situations within this evolutionary arms race between pathogens and humans that have caused pathogens to evolve to become less harmful in the past, such as with syphilis, can be extremely useful for practitioners in clinical medicine and public health. This is because they can show us how we can manipulate or artificially change conditions under, with mo under which modern pathogens are spread, like SARS-CoV-2, to potentially cause it to evolve to be less harmful as well. Another thing I'd like to note is that also the health and disease past population that we construct from the marks on skeletons can also be viewed as providing us with experiments from the past. It is not ethical to experiment on living humans in many different scenarios, but it can be invaluable to understand how human health and disease is shaped by many different environmental conditions. And this is especially true over the lifespan of a human over a long period of time. We have questions that we'd like to know the answers to, such as how do humans adapt to challenging situations? How far can we be pushed and how much can we adapt before we reach a breaking point and our health collapses into disease? When we look at the human past through skeletal remains, we can learn about the limits of human adaptation and exactly how human bodies respond to challenging environmental conditions from war to famine to pandemics to climate change. And we can then take these lessons about human resilience and apply them to modern populations and be able to identify the limits of resilience in threatened populations before they reach that and before they pass that boundary and collapse into experiences of disease. All right. What other questions do you have? Um, specifically, when we're thinking about pandemics, how are studies of past pandemics helping us to understand the current SARS-CoV-2 pandemic? That's a great question. So what's really, really interesting is if you look back at the literature from the past several decades, researchers in many different scientific domains have been warning us that a pandemic is coming soon. And in particular, they've very, been very concerned about a viral pandemic and the one that might spill over or jump from non-human animals into animals. The reason for this, because you might look at this now and think, well, they had a crystal ball. They knew that this was coming, is not because they had a magical ability to predict what would occur in the future, but because these researchers were using lessons from the human past about where pandemics come from how often they occur, and how they spread through human populations. And so a lot of researchers have for quite a long time that we would likely be faced as human societies with an experience like the coronavirus pandemic very soon. In particular, researchers have turned to pandemics in the past to get a really firm understanding of how pa pandemics affected human societies and why, and from this glean uh, specific information that might be useful for present societies and also future societies in planning for, unfortunately, the next pandemic. A lot of researchers have turned to the 1918 influenza pandemic, also called the 1918 Spanish flu, which was concurrent with World War I, and used that as a template for predictive studies about future pandemics for several decades. Now, this was also caused by a virus, and this also spilled over from non-human animals, and then in large part, courtesy of World War I, was able to spread around the globe. So scientists have looked at the conditions that facilitated the spread of this disease, which was also a respiratory virus, and have made predictions about how future pandemics would spread, their patterns of transmission, which communities they were likely to hit the hardest, and other uh, informative messages. For instance, past pandemics show us that groups who are of social inequality, those who are impoverished, those who are people of color and members of communities of color, 
those who are socially marginalized, such as people of um, diverse sexual orientations uh, and religious minorities are also more likely to be hit hard by uh, infectious disease pandemics in the past, in large parts because they are likely to have pre-existing health conditions and a lower level of overall health, courtesy of their lifelong marginalization and inadequate access to resources. They're also less likely to be able to protect themselves from the current pandemic. For instance, they're more likely to be what we call now essential workers, people who really are required to go in and perform physical tasks at work and are not able to work from home. The same is true when we look at the current SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, where we see very high rates of sickness and death in marginalized communities, communities of color and economically disadvantaged communities, such as indigenous groups on reservations and African-American communities and Latinx communities throughout the country. We can go even deeper into history than that and look at lessons from the Black Death, which has given historians a lot of rich material about how infectious diseases operated in the past. Recent studies that have recovered all of the DNA, so the entire DNA sequence from the pathogen that caused the Black Death, have shown that it caused just as much harm to human bodies in the past when as much as 30 to 50 percent of the population of Europe and Asia died during the Black Death. Um, as it does now, right? So the harm caused to the host um, in modern uh, strains of the plague is the same as the harm caused to the host in past strains of the plague that caused the Black Death. And this leads researchers to understand that it's not that the pathogen that caused the Black Death was terribly harmful, but instead that social and economic conditions left many members of those past populations during the medieval period much more exposed and much more vulnerable, resulting in such high rates of death. And we can take these messages into the future to better protect future communities from pandemics, and we can also use them in the present to try to step in the way of the harm caused by the current virus and buffer our disadvantaged communities through public health interventions and measures. What are the it's, questions? Do we have questions from our, uh, our participants? Well, I'd, I'd like to ask you about um, comorbidities and co-infections very, okay. very quickly. We need to finish up relatively soon. Um, we know that from the coronavirus pandemic that um, being sick with more than one condition at a time, something known as a comorbidity or co-infection when it involves more than one infectious disease, um, such as diabetes or obesity, can result in a higher likelihood of infection and severe sickness. Um, does evidence from history show the same patterns? And you were talking about this, but I'm wondering if, if you could just um, go into just a tiny bit of detail about, you know, the idea about co-infection and comorbidity. Um, yeah. Sure, it absolutely does. So some of our preliminary research on syphilis has already shown that if you are infected with another infectious disease, even the ones that cause something that we see as relatively harmless, such as gum disease, periodontal disease, or gingivitis, you're much more likely to have severe disease. We can go back in history to the Black Death. People who, were, uh, who died of the Black Death were more likely than people who survived the Black Death and didn't enter the archeological record, right? Where didn't die during the Black Death they were far more likely to have evidence that they were suffering from other disease conditions or it had very poor health and nutrition during their childhood, making them more vulnerable to a new severe um, outbreak of infectious disease. That's a great question. All right, well, it looks like we're running out of time. Um, first, thank you, Molly, for speaking on Bulldog Bites today. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone who joined us online via WebEx and Facebook Live. Um, we'd also like to thank the Alumni Association again for their invitation and please visit their website for more webinars and more information. Um, you can also visit the website for the Department of Anthropology and Middle Eastern Cultures at amec.msstate.edu to learn more about the department and our faculty, including a lot about Molly's work. Um, contact for information for all the faculty are listed on the website and um, please join us next time for Bulldog Bites. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Take care. All right, bye.